Thank you, Father, for your mercy, your grace, and your faithfulness. Thank you for reminding us that you are here with us through the thick and the thin. We bless your name today, and we pray that you would help us to continue to walk with you and to model and really live out what you have for us in the earth. In Christ's name, amen. A few Sundays ago, uh, we took a little bit of a break from this particular series uh, to honor the resurrection of the Lord and to focus a little bit more on that. But it's been in my heart to, to get back to this particular emphasis that the Holy Spirit gave us in light of our theme for the year of uh, existing and living for God's glory and for humanity's good. We've talked a lot about that and so I don't want to get off track by going back into it except to say that most of our lives we are living to accomplish what we think will, will bring us happiness and may even help other people. And to that end, God gets glory as long as it's something that really is his purpose being fulfilled. One of the purposes that God has for us is that we would really understand the power of our relationships, the power of our relationships and what they exist for. Uh, sometimes you can just kind of live your life existing and getting through and the emphasis is on things outside of that set of relationships. But God is relational. What God wants is relationship with humanity. He doesn't just want humanity living out of a sense of duty with him. God really wants love relationships. It's really what he wants. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, the scripture goes on to say, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through his son might be saved or might be rescued. So relationship to God is a really, really big thing. Most people focus on results. I, I'm of the persuasion that you'd never get the kind of result. Listen carefully. You never get the kind of result. By that I mean the quality of result that you really long for or need if relationships are bad. You can build buildings, you can raise money, you can do things, and you can impress people with how much you have done. But the truth of the matter is, the quality of what we are doing suffers when our relationships are not healthy and strong and Christ honoring. Uh, this is what I believe was part of what, what the writer of the Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, was inspired by as, as this person wrote and ends this entire book with a list of admonitions for those who are going to walk by faith in God. As I've told you and taught you, the book of Hebrews was written about 35 to 38 years after Jesus had ascended into heaven. And he wrote it uh, to those Jewish by ethnicity or uh, Hebrews or Israelites who had uh, come into, many of who had come into a relationship with God through Jesus. But because of this, their, their decision to come into a relationship with, with Christ, many of them had been excommunicated, put out by their families, treated as if they were dead. And this was also a time of persecution that was amounting, uh, arising in, in the, in the uh, at the time, and so uh, this writer writes to really encourage them not to repudiate the faith. That's a big word, but it basically means to deny the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to deny that he's Messiah, to reject the way of salvation. That's really what that means. And the, and the word of God makes it very, very clear uh, through a number of warnings that they were not to do that. And yet, it almost sounds confusing because the writer says that he has great confidence that they would be saved and that they would not, they would not ever do that. 
Uh, I think it's important that we uh, understand contextually what God is really saying here. And that is that while it is possible, it is highly improbable that a genuine born again believer in Jesus will ever repudiate, will ever walk away from Christ. We may do things that dishonor God. We may do things that hurt the heart of God. And Hebrews 12 tells us what's going to happen when that happens. The scripture says that we would be severely disciplined. Uh, but that discipline really is a sign that we are genuine children of God. And so he's not talking about and warning against, you know, something that is just, you know, uh, a moral failure in the life of a believer. He's talking about someone who really consciously, the words that he uses in Hebrews 10, tramples the blood of the covenant under their feet. Knowledgeably. This is not someone who doesn't know what they're doing. They, they trample that. You go, man, what would it take to get me to a place where I would do that? Uh, I, I can't answer that for you. But the Bible warns against the deception of sin, hardness of heart, bitterness that rises up on the inside where we begin to question God, question God's integrity. You look throughout all of known biblical history. That's really the goal that Satan has. I don't know what he said to the angels in heaven. We're not angels, but I don't know what he said to them, the ones that believed him. Where they ended up being kicked out. Okay, but he's, he's, he's got a line. He uses situations that are very difficult. He rides in on them to try to convince you and me that the covenant relationship we have with God ain't worth the piece of paper is written on. That's the way he works. He doesn't wait till you're 50 years old to do that. I got saved when I was six. So I'm telling you from my experience. He doesn't wait that long. He starts when you're a kid. Okay, and then you, most of you have heard my story almost ad nauseum. When my little brother died, I was four. He was two. We are sitting at the funeral. Right? He started right then two years before I got saved because he's determined that you and I will never trust God. And even after we come to trust God, he's determined to try to get us to surrender that, to give up on that. I don't care how much success you have in walking with God. It doesn't make any difference to the enemy. You know what he's waiting on in my life? Me to get to the point where I'm 90, 95 years old, where I'm cussing God out. After all the stuff we did for you. See, that's, that's, that's his motive. And he doesn't let up. It always seems like God is the one that was unfair and he ain't right. Uh, I don't, I, I can't gauge this. I have no scientific test to prove this. But through my experience, um, it seems like most Christians are angry with God about something and don't even know it. They're upset with God about what he's allowed. That's why they're always back and forth on what not they're going to do what God said do. Till you settle it. Job said it like this. Though you slay me. He wasn't, he wasn't talking to his friends. He wasn't even talking to the devil. The Hebrew is... He will kill me, talking about God. He will kill me. Yet, will I trust him? Ah, yes, sir. So this, the Hebrew boy said it like this. Oh, king, you got your dummy idol standing up there. We feel the heat off of the furnace. God is able to deliver us out of your hand. And he's going to do it. But if, even if not, let it be known. We will, these knees.
knees will never bow. Ah, yes. See, folk, folk, folk like that, that's who the devil can't stand because you can't be bought. You're not serving God for a car and a house and a baby and a job and a ministry. You're serving God because he's God. He's God. He's God. He's God. He doesn't have to meet my moral standard of what I think is right and wrong. He's God. And he deserves my praise. Come on, somebody. Bless him up in here. Yes. Hallelujah. He's God. He's God. Hallelujah. Okay. I, I, I don't know what that for. Uh, okay, I'm... I'm t- <laughs> Hallelujah. He's God. You know, I, I think I think some folk, some folk really believe that we created God. And see, when you create your own God, you can tell him how to live and how to run your life. But we didn't create God. God created us. And that may come as a shock to some folk, but God is king. And I know there are some kings that have clowned. There are some kings that ain't done stuff right, but God does it all right. Even when we don't understand it. Bless the name of Jesus. Oh, I feel Jesus in the room right now. Yes, sir. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. He's word. He's word. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's word. You see, you see what God, what God said to, Je- what, what the devil said to God. He said, look, you, you just, just let me touch him. Let me take that stuff that he got. That's why he's serving you. He's serving you because of the stuff and you blessed him. You got a hedge around him. I can't get to him, but let me get to him. Ah, glory to God. And the, de- and the Lord said, okay, I'm going to let you get to him, but I'm going to let you get to him only so far. Because I already know my boy. I already know him. Yes, sir. Well, okay. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The psalmist, I, I, there's some, you know, you feel like you're at this place where you, I heard this scripture this morning where you're almost in despair, man. I mean, you know, it's like, what am I going to do? And no matter how much I do and how much I'm trying to serve God, it looks like it's just getting worse. Uh, God's going to use you and me to give a, the devil a nervous breakdown. Let me put it in that kind of thing. He know how much you can take. But after a while, the enemy's going to get the point. I don't care what the Lord let me put on that boy. He's going to bless God anyhow. Tell your neighbor, don't despair. God's got this. He's got this. He got you and he's got this. Yes, he does. He's got it. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I remember, I remember, I remember struggling uh, even in the earlier days of, of this ministry. You know, because you school and you know, all the things you learn and all the things you're exposed to that are designed to inspire you. They're really not designed to get you to be in competition with anybody, but they're designed and shared with you to inspire you to believe God and to trust God. But, but I'm telling you, uh, sometimes when you walk out what God says do, the very opposite happens 
of what you think is going to happen. And over the years, the Lord has blessed us here at Metro. We're seeing tremendous things take place. And uh, ever since 2004, we have declined in terms of numbers. And uh, the Lord, Lord spoke to my spirit. I was working on my doctorate about four or five years ago. He spoke to my heart. He said, I'm going to do a new thing in the house. But I'm going to prune and it's going to look like you ain't got nothing. Glory to God. Uh, he said, you did some things wrong. You messed up on some things. You made a lot of mistakes. But you held on to me, son. And uh, you, you stand with me. And I'm going to do something now. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. So I, I realize that, that what I'm saying to you, uh, it sounds familiar. For those of us who are older, you've been here for a long time. It sounds familiar, but the real goal that God has for you and me, uh, in this sense, is to believe him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the toughest fight you're going to have. It's, it's the fight of faith. That's the, there isn't a tougher fight. Everybody that tunes out because you, you, know, you just don't get it and you don't understand. It's here really it is. It's, it's the fight of faith. It's trust in God. That's the biggest fight you'll ever have in your entire life. And it's specifically it's in trusting God. Especially when you know God could have. But he didn't. He could have worked it out like you envisioned and he didn't do it that way. He could have did what you thought was best to be done and he didn't do it. You got tears lapping your jaws and God didn't change it. You know what? Job said at the end of the story, Job 42, he said, ah, uh, I thought I knew you. Uh-huh. But now I see no purpose of yours shall be withheld from you. I mean, that was a mouthful. In other words, everything I went through, all the stinking boils, all my kids dying, Everything I just went through, losing everything, your purpose. You ram it into the devil's face. Glory to God. It's a lot easier if, if the Lord had sit Job down and said, look, here's what I'm getting ready to do. Now me and the devil done had a talk and he gonna come at you with everything he got, but I just want you to hold on, hold on, hold on. God didn't say nothing that to Job. Job woke up one morning and had 10 funerals. Why? Because God expected Job to live what he had already saw in him. He's going to trust God. Trust God. Vindication is coming for you, sir. The Lord said three times to me this morning. Vindication. It's coming for you in your life. There's a restoration of the purpose of the Lord. There's a word, a restoration of the calling of God. For you've said even in the night season, Lord, can it be that a man who has come this way will ever be able to stand and show his face? For I shall restore and I shall vindicate not only your name, but even the call of God upon your life. For I shall make your prophetic voice even in this hour and the burden that's in your spirit, even for the young and for those that shall come behind, there shall be a divine connection and you shall lay your hands upon many and release them into the will of God. Don't shrink back. May the Lord just wipe away from your very spirit. That's it, from your very spirit. Every accusation, every lie, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. No fear concerning your health. For the hand of God shall rest upon you. We bless him in the name of Jesus. As brother, brother Kenny Jackson. Powerful. Buried his brother. Give me bury his brother tomorrow. Powerful word of the Lord to him. That's the Lord. We thank God for him. Amen. Okay, so I, I'm going to try to do this again. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's, you know, I, I keep, I keep, 
I keep coming here trying to get us out at a certain time. And some of y'all just keep pulling and pulling and pulling. <laughs> My Lord. This, this is not the way you grow, a, a, get a big church, staying in church all day. You can't stay in church all day and have a big church. You cannot do it. We got to do an hour, an hour, 15 minutes and have lines of folk waiting to get back in. And if that's what it is, if that's how the Lord gave you, fine. But I'm telling you, down here in the hood, we need something else. We need the power, the anointing of God to break and crush every yoke. And it just take time sometimes. It just take time. It just, it just, it just take time sometimes. Every time I go to emergency, I don't ever want to stay. I know it's going to be at least three hours. Glory to God. And that's, that's what church is like here. Down here, it's like the emergency room every Sunday. You come for 15 minutes, want to get on in there and get out of there. It ain't like that sometimes. All right? So we, if you got to leave, you got to go. I understand. You don't have to put your finger up like we used to in church. Just do, do what you got to do. Amen. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm in a restorative process myself physically. And uh, so I, I understand, you know, got to be understanding of people and what you're going through and how you're facing and what you're facing. So, you know, if you have to slip out, God bless y'all. It's wonderful. Love this too long. But I got to go. Okay. <laughs> Praise the 